good evening uh, and thank you for coming to our event, uh, Capital Punishment and Interfaith uh, Conversation and Co-Victim Perspectives. I'm Jonathan Mann, your host. Uh, when I studied philosophy, Alan Watts resonated with me. Watts said about faith, quote, to have faith is to trust yourself to the water. When you swim, you don't grab hold of the water because if you do, you'll sink and drown. Instead, you relax and float. Faith can be a great comfort and a powerful ally during trying times. Tonight, we'll hear from Pastor Joel Miller of the Columbus Mennonite Church and Rabbi Rick Kellner of Congregation Beth Tikva about their faith and perspectives on the death penalty. We'll listen to the experiences of Jane Mitchell, Rukhaya Abdul Mufta Kalim, LaShawn Ajamu, and Lynette Grace, who, like myself, are co-victims. Co-victims in this context are people who have lost loved ones to homicide. These include family members, other relatives or kin, and friends of the deceased. The general public, in my experience, isn't aware of the lack of support, resources, and care co-victims receive. We're often left twisting in the wind. Ending capital punishment isn't simply about the perpetrators or even the deceased. It's also about the co-victims who live on, trying to pick up the pieces of their families' lives while mapping out a path to healing. I hope their stories will help educate, spark introspection about faith, the failures of the death penalty, and how you can help. We'll be taking questions at the end of this event. If you do have a question, please privately message Allison Cohen. She's our Director of Communications. She's labeled as Tech Support. And now we'll hear from Pastor Joel Miller of the Columbus Mennonite Church. Joel? Thanks, Jonathan. Good, e good evening, everybody. Good to see faces and names gathered here. I'm gonna share just a little bit about, um, from a Mennonite perspective, from how we interpret our, our Christian faith, how we have understood um, the death penalty and why we are opposed and hoping, praying, working that it end in Ohio. Um, so I just have three quick things to say. One is going back to our beginnings. Um, um, the Mennonite faith came out of 16th century Europe, it's where it started when the Western church was starting to splinter Catholic, Protestant, um, different Protestant groups. And the group that became the Mennonites was um, interpreted their faith um, in a nonviolent way. And because of that was not siding with any of those groups um, as they fought against each other. And because of that kind of became the enemy of all the groups. Um, so we ourselves experienced violence at the hands of the state. We have a whole thick book that we call the Martyr's Mirror that details these really gory stories and burnings at the stake and drownings and awful things that happened to um, our Anabaptist forebears, Mennonites. Um, and so first of all, just having this memory of, of state violence being directed at us is itself a um, uh, a reason to be opposed to the death penalty because we have this memory in our faith. There's there's passages in the Torah of, of the Bible that talk about remember that you were oppressed in Egypt, um, and therefore that affects how you live in the present moment. And so having that memory um, affects our ethics and our approach to how others um, ought to be treated as well. So that's the first part, just our just our beginnings. Um, secondly, we have understood the teachings and life and ministry of Jesus as an outright rejection of violence. That's how we've interpreted that in our tradition. That shows up in the parables that he told in Beatitudes, like blessed are the peacemakers, um, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Um, it has to do with the way that he confronted the powers of his time and ultimately was a victim of state violence him, himself. Um, a cross was what happened when you uh, when Rome thought that you were um, doing too much against them. Um, and so um, we see Jesus is living out the prophetic vision of Isaiah and Micah of beating swords into plowshares using things that were um, maybe initially designed for violence to use that same material to turn into um, things for nourishment and posit positive, the common good in the community. 
Um, and just to, just to show a little bit, so we're named after Menno Simons, and he, just a quote from him, this is a 16th century guy, his approach to the death penalty, kind of straight, really straightforward. He said, if the transgressor should repent for, for such as one to be hanged would look strange and unbecoming. If he remained impenitent and his life be taken, one would unmercifully rob him of the time of repentance. Um, so this this very this very straightforward um, approach of seeing this human being as um, a brother or a sister, and um, not wanting to cut their life short. Um, so there's the there's the beginnings. There's our understanding of our of our faith and especially the life of Jesus. And then third, I would add that our denomination, our organized church, has made official statements. Um, against the death penalty in 1965, Mennonites in, US, in the US and Canada, and then uh, reaffirmed that in 2001. And just a little bit of language in, uh, from those statements. Um, it says, in view of our Christian responsibility to value all human life, we are compelled to set forth our opposition to all capital punishment. The criminal justice system has sent innocent people to death row, and the death penalty is applied in a racially discriminatory fashion and disproportionately to some of society's most vulnerable people. And we acknowledge the deep grief of families of murder victims and victims of capital punishment laws. We hold them in our prayers and commit ourselves to walk with them. So those, that's just some of the language that our church has used and some of the commitments that we have made together, which... Um, uh, apply to the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, it's definitely educational. You know, I, I will freely admit I'm not very familiar about the Mennonite faith, so so it's great to gain some perspective. Um, next up, we have Rabbi Rick Kellner of Congregation Beth Tikva. Rick. Thank you, Jonathan, and it is always uh, wonderful to work with uh, Reverend Miller on, on uh, to pursue justice. We've been uh, working together for uh, many years uh, on, on issues locally here in, in Columbus. Uh, I'm going to uh, share a few views um, about the Reformed Jewish tradition, and I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen to kind of give us a sense of our journey of where we've come from and uh, what we've, how we view uh, uh, capital punishment in, in the Jewish community. Uh, first of all, uh, as, as uh, Reverend Miller mentioned, uh, views in the Torah and the idea of, of uh, being slaves in, in Egypt, of course, we're gonna be reading those words in just uh, a, a little over a week's time when we gather around our Passover Seder. So that experience is also one that is, is very touching to, to us as well. Uh, in the in the in the Bible, if you only look at the Bible for for or the Torah for for Jewish views, you would actually think that we would uh, be very supportive of capital punishment. I put up three verses on the screen, um, among others that exist to show that that there is a, a history of capital punishment in, from from the Torah. In Genesis nine it says the shedder of human blood that that person's blood shall be shed by another human. Uh, in the book of Exodus in chapter twenty one we have a couple of verses that say the one who fatally strikes another shall be put to death. And then in uh, Exodus uh, a couple of verses later and the one that strikes his father or mother shall be put to death uh, as well. Uh, scholars tend to think that this was possible in biblical times only because they didn't necessarily have any other forms of, of punishment. But the conversation about Jewish uh, tradition and Jewish observance on this and, and Jewish law on this develops uh, much later. And in the, in the first or second century, uh, the rabbis begin to look about how we might create society. And there is a book called uh, the Mishnah, which is a code of Jewish law that, that the rabbis are imagining uh, what the society they would look to create would be like, uh, and as if they, they had uh, authority and were, were leaders, and in some instances they did have local uh, authority. And so in, in, the, in the Mishnah, there's a book called Makot, which says that a Sanhedrin, which is, is a, a, an, an ancient name for a court that executes a criminal once in seven years is known as a destructive court. And then another rabbi, Rabbi Elazar, son of Azaria says, no, 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 a Sanhedrin that does it in once in 70 years is known as destructive. 
And then Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva say that if they had been members of the Sanhedrin, no one would have ever been executed. And so we see this development of Jewish law reflecting the idea that that it is actually out of bounds in Jewish tradition. And when the Jewish community was faced with the practical implementation of law, they said that we are they were opposed to, to the death penalty. We fast forward another thousand years to the time of Maimonides, who uh, lived in Spain and, and Egypt as well. This is a statue of him in Cordoba, Spain. Um, in his, he, he compiles a Jewish, uh, a code of Jewish law called the Mishnah Torah uh, and among his uh, many works. And in, in, in this particular teaching is from a book called Sefer HaMitzvot, HaMitzvot, the book of Mitzvot, the book of commandments. And in this book, he teaches, it is better and more satisfactory to acquit a thousand guilty persons than to put a single innocent one to death. And this speaks to such a critical concern that we have today when someone might, uh, who is innocent might end up on, on death row and, and be sentenced to death and, and ultimately uh, executed if, if they are innocent. There are far too many people on, on, on death row who have serious and valid claims to innocence. And Maimonides says he's really underscoring the importance of not putting an innocent person to death. And, and he recognizes that uh, a death sentence and, and the, uh, ex the literal execution of that death sentence comes with a, uh, an impossibility f to, to do teshuva. And, and, to, to, uh, and, and if we're wrong, there, there's, no going, there's no going back. Um, and, and, and like Reverend Miller shared with, with uh, the Mennonite tradition in modern times, our movement, the Union for Reform Judaism, which was then called the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, adopted a resolution in 1959 that says, we believe there's no crime for which the taking of human life by society is justified. And that is the obligation of society to evolve other methods in dealing with crime. We appeal to our congregations and to our co-religionists and to all who cherish God's mercy and love to join in effort to eliminate this practice of capital punishment, which lies as a stain upon civilization and our religious coexistent uh, conscience. It's been a part of our movement now for for more than uh, more than 50 years. Uh, and and then uh, also uh, uh, our, the Central Conference of, of American Rabbis a little less than uh, 50 years ago says both in concept and in practice, Jewish tradition found capital punishment repugnant, and there is no persuasive evidence that capital punishment serves as a deterrent to crime. So the rabbinic body of the reform movement I, uh, uh, has shared has shared this statement as as well, and it is clear in our tradition when we had to put the the tradition into practicality that we had to practice Jewish law that. Capital punishment has been out of bounds for us for, for nearly two millennia and, and that we continue to advocate and do work to abolish the, the death penalty uh, here in, in modern times as well. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kilmer. And, you know, I, I think you touch on some some critical points here in, in talking about the death penalty, even as co-victims, as people who've lost loved ones to murder, Many of us, um, certainly the people that are speaking today, recognize that that there are folks on the other side that um, need our help, love, and support too. Um, you know, the, the death penalty, um, its wake of destruction it isn't aimed in one direction. It, it goes in the mall, and, and the, the impact, um, I don't think, is what we originally intended. And as you can see throughout history, it's something we've debated. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jane Mitchell. Jane, Jane Mitchell is a co-victim like myself, and um, her story is is powerful. And, and Jane, I, I'd love for you to to talk a little bit uh, now, if you if you'd like. Okay, I'm Jane Mitchell. I um I live in Dublin, so I am a constituent of Senator Coonsie, and my brother was murdered um, in August of 2006. His body was found floating in um, Crystal Lake Park in Urbana, and he had been in the lake a couple of days. He'd been beaten, and um, we think he was unconscious when he went into the water, but his ultimate cause of death was drowning. Um, he was only wearing underpants, um, and we knew he'd been murdered because his home had been broken into a few times before this. Um, he had, um, 
He was test going to testify against his ex-girlfriend because he was a witness to her child abuse. And so she had threatened him and a number of other people had threatened him. So, um, you know, and his house had been broken into, he had already been attacked once. So he had actually left Urbana and, um, you know, to stay away until the children's services finished their investigation. And he had only gone back for the day to get his truck. Um, my family was just devastated by this. Uh, we had to have a private funeral because we didn't know who had killed him, although we had suspicions, but we didn't know if anybody was going to show up at the funeral or not. So um, he didn't really get a funeral that he would have deserved. Um, uh, we were all full of anger and grief and fear. And um, his death almost tore up my family. My dad never got over it. And he died five months later. He was a broken man from this. My sister, who had to identify the body, still has nightmares. Um, my one brother from Georgia blamed another brother from Illinois because he, had, he should have known um, you know, who was doing this. Um, and my family has never had a ho family holiday in the last 15 years since he died. Um, I was outraged, you know, how does somebody take away somebody who was so special to me, but I was also very angry at the police. Um, his, his, um, clothes were never found. His, uh, wallet and phone were missing. Um, he had a large amount of cash with him because he had cashed in his bank account to move to Florida till this was over. Um, and none of that was found. His truck was found in a hotel where, in a motel lot where he had not stayed, but the police did not investigate how the truck got there. The phone continued to be used after his death and we gave them the phone records and they said they didn't have the uh, resources to figure out who was using it. The, his credit cards continued to be used in places that had CCTV and we asked them to save it, but the police never went and picked it up because it was out of town. And the head, um, the, the, the detective in charge of this was actually heard to say, he's just another dead druggie. Um, Ed was more than a druggie. Yes, he did use cocaine. Um, but to us, he was not a druggie. He was a hilarious kid who had severe, severe learning disabilities from before that was ever identified as a disability. So at 47 years old, he could, could barely read or write or do basic math. But in spite of this, he was a skilled carpenter and an over-the-road trucker. And um, he was everybody's favorite uncle because he would play with the kids. And in fact, he taught my three daughters how to play blackjack using crayons to bet with. Um, he was generous and compassionate and he loved people and animals and he would help anybody who needed it. And um, he was also very forgiving. Um, he had told one of my sisters that when he saw what his ex-girlfriend was doing to her kids, he said he looked into the face of evil and then he had to think, what was it that made her like that, that she could do something? The police never arrested the killer. All the evidence is long gone. So they never will. Um, and I have no doubt that the Urbana police still don't have the resources or even the inclination to follow up on this murder. Um, I wanted justice for my brother. I believe in consequences and um, at the time, you know, I was angry enough um, that my gut reaction was, I want to catch his killer and put him to death. But then I had to stop and think, this was still a possibility because Illinois had not abolished a death penalty like they have now. But back then, it was still a possibility. But so I had to stop and think about how I really felt about the death penalty. And um, as I you know, even though I was a sister of a murder victim, I realized that I didn't want his killer to die, not at the hands of people. 
I wanted the killer to have consequences. I wanted them to be um, incarcerated for the rest of their life. But um, I couldn't justify the pain that um, killing his, his murderer would have done to another family. I knew what we had gone through because of his death. And I, I would, couldn't justify putting another family through that, um, even though they were related to the person who did the deed. Um, I, I um, ironically, I have actually taught two, two people who turned out to be murderers. Um, I taught at the Tulsa Boys Home. Um, I taught boys who were considered too violent to go to special ed classes in a regular school building. And of those boys that I taught, two of them have ended up murdering people themselves. One of them was what you would call a monster. He was, uh, you know, he had, he looked on people as objects. He had no compassion, no empathy for anybody. And he actually, um, his brother had the remote and wouldn't change the channel. So he killed his brother and watched the TV that he wanted to watch. I, the problem is that this kid, if he, well, he was an adult by then, but if he had been in Ohio, he would not be eligible for the death penalty because he was carrying a label of sociopathic personality disorder. The other kid um, came from a horrific background um, of drugs and abuse, and his parents were teaching the kids how to steal things. And he killed somebody um, when he was 16. He was high as a kite on drugs when he killed him. He would have been eligible for the death penalty because he did not have a label of mental illness. Um, the only thing that saved him from the death penalty was his age. And then I had to think about what Ed had said. Um, what did that person have to go through to make them the person who could kill somebody, who could take their own, somebody else's life? And that's a question that a judge or jury could never fully answer um, because before they sentence someone to death. And that's why I truly believe that Ohio needs to get rid of the death penalty. So that's my story. I mean, thank you for sharing. I, I there is so much overlap in in what you speak of in your experiences that I've gone through, and everyone else that will speak after you has has as well. I, I know that you know that, but for everyone listening, Jane's pain and experience is not an anomaly. What has happened to her family happens to our families, happens to all families who go through this. The thing that I must impart to all of you is that we are not being taken care of as those who are wronged. We are not being looked after. We are not getting the support we need uh, down to law enforcement, getting better training on how to interact with people who've lost loved ones to, to violence like this. Next up is my good friend, Rukaya Abdul Mukta Kalim. Uh, I, she has a very powerful story as well, and I am honored to, to share her to tell it with you. Rukaya? Rukaya, you're on mute. <laughs> Rukaya, you're still on mute. I'm clicking there, finally. All right. Usually they un unmute, so I sit and wait until I'm allowed to unmute. <laughs> good after, good evening, everyone. My name is Rukaya Zafrab Dumutakalim, and I am the CEO and founder of the Musketeer Association. And though that title seems to be very important, or well, for me, the most important title of all is that I'm a mother. I am a mother. And though my son, my baby, my youngest, is not physically with us, he is spiritually with us. And I feel him every moment of every day. I miss him. But at the same time, I hear his voice. Help them. Help them because they don't know. On 
June 28th, 2015. My son was walking home from picking up food to take home to his family is walking under a poorly lit overpass in a community that he chose to live in. He didn't have to live there. He chose to because he wanted to help them, help them to understand that being poor just means being poor. You can clean your streets yourself. You can smile and put a warmth in someone's life that will enter into their hearts and make them feel better. What they in this community was going through was something that had been put into our legislation many years ago and told our people, a certain group of people, you can't do any better and we won't let you by the way they passed their laws. But he wanted them to know that they are not of their laws. They don't make up their laws like that. That's not their life. You are human beings. He was raised with an Islamic understanding about life. So on that 28th night, as he walked home, three assailants walked up behind him and shot him in the back of the head. They took $40 off his person after he fell into the gutter and he was still alive. They took his cell phone and the food he was taking home. But what really quaked me to my bones as I walked that, watched the surveillance camera that was positioned poorly is that these three assailants, they didn't run away. They walked away. He was still alive. They didn't even have the empathy as I thought. They don't have any empathy to call 911. They have his cell phone. Now on this surveillance camera, all you saw was silhouettes. You couldn't really see who they really were. Now he didn't, by the grace of the creator, he did not die that night. I got to say goodbye to my son on the 29th day. And my family got to say goodbye to him, though he could not respond. I'm going to go because through this, I'm not going to continue with this part of it. Because to me, that was a favor, a great favor from the creator, because many do not get to say goodbye to their loved ones. Many. When I saw the assailants, the two that they arrested, because there were three of them, 14-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 25-year-old who led the boys, those children, to doing a heinous crime. It was heinous because it was merciless. I saw them in court. And the first thing I said was, my Lord, they're children, babies. What happened to those babies? Because I know one thing that we are not taught about anymore, innate laws. There are innate laws that make it so we can live in harmony on this earth with each other. And one of the innate laws, and there are many of them, it's how children are born because they are a gift to us. They are born with five things, five gifts. They are born with light in their eyes, joy in their voice, hope in their hearts, a curious mind, and they're always reaching up, reaching up. They could be cross-eyed, no arms, no legs. They don't know they're babies, they don't know what they know is that they are happy. This you didn't put in them. So what is happening to our children is what I ask. What happened to those boys? Not what, why my son, not why me. What happened to them? And I had to know because I know this innate law. I know many of them. I live my life 
through and by and with them because we have to. We're a flower garden of humanity and we have refused to accept that understanding. And because we have, we feel as if we have the right to take someone's life without knowing what happened to them when they were children, because children are not born with guns in their hands. They're not born with lying, stealing, cheating, hating, of any type of hate, racism, color. They're not born that way. These are learned bad behaviors. And if our court system, which it is, has put in place the type of laws that do condemnation, you're not judging. You're not judging. No, you're condemning. And you are saying who should live and who should die. And you seem to be using, and you do, prejudice to do this. I come from a day of time way back when the civil rights started. And I don't mean in the 60s, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking back when we made the decision to say, stop, we're human. You cannot treat us this way. We will take it no more. And we lifted our voices from our heart. And we took that beat down so you would stop. You would simply stop. But the legislative laws took the Jim Crow laws and put them in our society. And some of us sat back sleeping, acting as if you didn't see it happening. So I'm here not to tell you the story of my son and how we have dealt with his loss. Because for us, he's not gone. Because the message he had was stop. The message he had was that you are human and you have a right to live in peace. He cared about them. He was not doing, he didn't do drugs. He didn't hang on the corner. He didn't even smoke cigarettes, nor did he drink. What he had was that heart to care about human beings and to see what was going wrong in our society and speak up for it. And as much as I wish I had been chosen and that he would be here telling you this story, I wasn't given that choice. So I'm here to tell his story and I'm here to stand on this mission. Our children, and they were children when they got molested. The majority of the people in these prisons, the children came out with those five things. If you have not asked that question, being so called justice, then you have not done the fair justice. And that must stop. The Musketeer Association launched Two years ago, the nationwide campaign, stop. Stop the violence, stop the racism, stop the fascism, now, stop. We're not backing off from it. I John Opsy because I believe that we have the most unjust laws in this country than we've ever had and they are hidden behind religion. We use our religion to justify. And that's not right. Because faith is not a religion. It is a way of life. And faith tells us to be fair and just. And remember that we are a flower garden of humanity. We didn't get to choose our parents. We didn't get, they, they didn't get to choose us. We didn't get to choose the land we're born in. We didn't get to even choose the tongue we speak. We had no say in any of it, but we are supposed to be men and women of understanding 
and our children come out with no understanding. They look to us to teach them how to reach up with safety and do marvelous things with the gifts they've been given. So, though I could go on and on, and he knows I can, I want you to know one thing, that as I did my own research all the way back into 1990s to find out what has been happening to our children, at least 25% of the people that have died with this wrongful law were innocent. If you can sleep at night, I don't know how, unless you have told yourself you, it doesn't touch you. Well, I guarantee you as a faith, as a person who has spiritual connection, every one of us are connected and what hurts one hurts us all. And if it hasn't come to your door yet, continue to ignore what we have put in place, calling it a just law. It will soon be at your door. Thank you, Rukaya. That's uh, extremely powerful. Um, I wanna make sure that we're on time here and, and give our next speaker and the one after the, the time that they need. The next person to speak is LaShawn Ajamu. Uh, LaShawn has a very powerful story as well and I'll let her tell it, LaShawn. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thank you everyone for having me tonight. And it is an honor uh, to be here. Um, so, in uh, 1997, uh, my brother James Nero was brutally gunned down in a road rage incident in Canton, Ohio. And after the minor accident, uh, James had insisted that the other driver provide his insurance information. But instead, the driver uh, returned from his car with a gun and he shot my brother in the face. Uh, he then shot James again, point blank, as he lay on the pavement. Uh, my brother James was just 20, and he was a proud father of an 18-month-old son. Um, and like every 20-year-old, he had many plans and dreams. I thank God that I saw my brother James on the last day of his life because during our last time, he had hugged me really, really tight that day and told me that he loved me. And at least I'll remember him with that. So it changed me for two reasons, because the first reason, he was my baby brother. We were three years apart. So with that, I had to teach my brother a lot, meaning I had to teach him how to walk, I had to teach him how to talk, and I had to teach him how to walk twice because we were both born bow-legged and uh, he was more bow-legged than I. So my parents decided we gotta break his legs, but we'll keep you bow-legged because it looks cuter on you. It paid off for me because I ended up marrying my husband because of my bow-legs. but. I feel like I failed my brother because I'm the one that helped him walk twice. And I couldn't save him this time. So when the court case about his murder was over, my brother was still dead. And my family had never, and I mean never, we, we never experienced this type of intense trauma of losing a loved one to murder. And we had no idea how to deal with this pain. Uh, no state, city, agency ever provided our family with any information about resources available to help us deal with the situation. We only had ourselves in our church community. And we were on our own as far as the state of Ohio was concerned. This is why when state officials and Others say we have execution so that victims' families can have justice and finality and closure. I say that's just political grandstanding. 
in any case, I know that an execution wouldn't have helped my family heal. Among other issues, Ohio does a disservice to families when the killer is sentenced to death because the family has to put their healing process on hold for decades through the capital punishment appeals process. All those years means that the family is being, they're holding their breath and suffering through court case after court date, newspaper article after newspaper article. And honestly, without a death sentence, in our case, we began our healing as soon as the trial was over with. If there had been a death sentence, we'd probably still be waiting. The man that killed my brother was Terry Freeman and he put the two bullets in my brother's head. <laughs> but killing this man, it wouldn't have brought my brother James back. And honestly, I don't want the state using my pain or anyone else's pain to justify another family losing their loved one, even if they are guilty. There's no such thing as closure because there will always be an empty seat at the table, especially my table, when all of my family, when we gather and my brother's not there. So my only plea is this, instead of wasting resources trying to execute a handful of killers, Ohio can do a lot better for murder victims, family members. For instance, my family could have used counseling and other kinds of support instead, which I believe would have helped our recovery and grief. Ohio does support some victims' families, but it varies greatly among the 88 counties in Ohio. We need to fix that. Trained, certified, qualified mental health professionals must be available to any family experiencing homicide. They should be available to all without disparity of access based on race, economics, geographics, or prior unrelated encounters with law enforcement. Because guess what? They tried to say that my brother, because of his prior convictions, that's why they went ahead and let Terry Freeman walk free and justified him killing my brother because he had prior convictions. <laughs> we need to fix that. Contact the Senator, talk about what we talked about tonight. Email, get on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, do what you have to do. Let's end the death penalty because without, with life without parole, these cases will be over in a few years unlike decades it takes for the death penalty to go through the legal process. Let's end that. Let's end the death penalty. I'm also a victim because my husband, Kwame Ajamu, was wrongfully incarcerated, him, his friend, and his brother. They all spent a total of 43 years in prison for a crime that they did not commit. Let's stop that. Let's get all of the men life without parole. We don't need to kill them. It's not our call. Like I said, call the Senator, call, call, call everyone, let them know. Thank you. Well, Sean, I've heard your story so many times and, and every time it, it brings chills down my spine and you know, I couldn't have said it better. What we go through doesn't have to happen. And what, what needs to happen is resources need to be shifted to families like yours, mine, like Rukaya's, like Jane's, so that we can get the help and the healing that we need. Our next speaker is Lynette Grace. And uh, uh, Lynette has a very powerful story as well that I, I would love for her to share with us now. Lynette, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Lynette Grace, and my story is um, after I buried my mom, um, I went to visit my spiritual mother in Columbus, Ohio, and she and her son got into an argument that escalated into him stabbing her to death. 
and without provocation, he began stabbing me. And after um, some years passed, um, I wanted to know why his mom had to die that day. And he told me that they were arguing over the telephone. And that's what caused him to become so angry. Um, and that's what caused him to, to kill his mother. Um, before I left the prison, he asked me if I could possibly forgive him for his actions against me. I said, yes, I can forgive you. And my reason for forgiving the young man was I couldn't do anything less for him than what God had done for me by allowing me to make it out of the house alive. Um, my faith doesn't condone revenge seeking. And I, choose, I ch and I chose to forgive the young man. And he said with me forgiving him, he was able to forgive himself. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a, a good thing, the, the, the forgiveness um, process, you know, not only healed me, it, it healed him as well. And hopefully as he shares the story of forgiveness in prison where he is, it, it could possibly help others. Um, moving on to my feelings about the death penalty, I feel that um, it doesn't bring the murdered person back as, you know, it's been shared by others. You know, I'm agreeing with that. You know, the death penalty does not bring the young, the young, the person that was uh, harmed or killed back. And also, if the person um, that was arrested for a crime is innocent and a sentence to death um, has been, you know, if the person was sentenced to death and then it was discovered later that the person was innocent then that's another life that, that's been lost. In addition to it being costly, um, a statewide opinion um, revealed that 59% of Ohioans um, support replacing the death penalty with life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the wake of these types of tragedies, um, families need support. Um, uh, they need grief counseling as it was shared before uh, child care, uh, just help uh, all the way up across the board. You know, the, the loss of a breadwinner, you know, has been lost. They need resources, you know, support to, to help that uh, missing person, you know, being gone. And um, the death penalty is at least three times more expensive than other sen sentencing uh, opinion uh, options. Um, Ohio should be one of the states across the country that is doing away with the death penalty. Capital punishment is inhumane and ineffective um, to say the least. And in closing, I would like to say um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you. Oh, can I say one more thing? Can I, say, I travel can. and share a story of forgiveness. I have buttons that say forgiveness is contagious, pass it on. So I, I, I do you know, travel and share a story of forgiveness. I just wanted to to share that uh, as well, that, you know, my ministry is about forgiveness and second chances. And uh, now I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> no, th thank you for sharing, Lynette. And yeah, it, Lynette is, um, she's a ray of sunshine in, 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 a, in a dark context of a conversation, as, as are the rest of these women. You know, the, the level of um, forgiveness, faith, and compassion that they all can show um, it, it has been inspiring to me as someone who's been impacted as they have. And, and I want you all to consider if we have mercy and faith and forgiveness in our hearts, why can't our justice system? We are the ones that are impacted by this. We are the ones who struggle with this to put our lives back together. And yet we still find a way to make that possible to forgive others. So we need the justice system to recognize that.